what feels to me very strong racist ideology against Palestinians. Right. The, your life is chosen, decided for you by the military occupation. Why are the political elites, the so-called liberal elites of the world, why are they so silent? It's unbearable what they've done. And for, for, have to have done it with the full-blooded assent or the, of the leadership of, your, of most of Europe, Britain and the United States has brought the West into great disrepute. By not speaking out, you're helping to enable them. As the unrelenting Gaza killing of civilians continues unabated, another potential ethnic cleansing in Palestine is underway, again in plain sight. The gradual conquest of Palestinian land is continuing at pace, Armed Israeli settlers with the full backing of the state pillage and forcibly vacate entire villages and farming communities. Yet the international community remains mute. This is ethnic cleansing on two fronts. Today I have back on The Thinking Muslim, journalist, author and public commentator Peter Oborn, who has returned recently from a visit to the West Bank. Peter is almost unique in the mainstream media for being someone who has consistently called out the marginalization of the Muslim community, both here and abroad. Peter principally writes for the Middle East Eye, amongst other outlets. His books include The Fate of Abraham, Why the West is Wrong About Islam, and The Assault on Truth. Peter Oborn, welcome to The Thinking Muslim. It's a great pleasure to come back. Thank you for being here. Um, now, you've just returned from a two-week journey to the West Bank. I read a very disturbing piece you wrote that indicates settlers have increased their land grab. Please talk me through what you witnessed when you were there. Actually, I was, I think it was probably five weeks oh, in, wow. in East, East Jerusalem and the West Bank, and I got back about 10 days ago. Um, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite harrowing. Um, to travel around the West Bank at the moment okay. because literally every village I went to is under attack from settlers. Um, they all have the same, roughly the same story, which is that the settlers will come in um, often with machine guns. Um, they will beat up, uh, in, in, you know, farmers, um, any male. They'll often, they can attack women too. They'll get the, the children are traumatized by seeing their fathers or uncles beaten up. They, 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 they use the guns normally, you know, they might spray the water system. They'll go into houses, sort of rip, you know, just tear, tear them apart, steal money. Um, and in certain uh, mar uh, marginal, marginal, no, what's the right word? The smaller communities in around Mustafa Yatta in the south, mm -hmm. around the Hebron Hills, beautiful part of the world, breathtaking, they're much more vulnerable because they're surrounded by settlements and there may be just 200, 150 people living there. And they come in and they're driving, they're driving out the, uh, the herdsmen or the farmers. Some of these are very ancient. Well, they're all ancient communities. Some, some of the Bedouin, you know, it's... This is... Um, um, see, these are war crimes, actually, because it's occupied territory, and you're invariably the IDF will protect the uh, come in with the settlers or protect them if need be. So it's supported by the Israeli military, and they're driving um, the Palestinians off their land and away from their uh, ancient homes. Tell me about the IDF's role in protecting these settlers as they ransack these. Yeah, villages. it's uh, it's quite complicated, and I, I rely. I haven't. Well, I have. I've seen them with settlers, but the accounts I've got is they settlers might come in, and if the villagers resist, not with stones or something, the IDF will turn up and help. Um, or sometimes they will come in together with the IDF. Often it's hard to know because the settlers often win, wear military fatigues and carry guns. Mm. Um, some really harrowing uh, uh, videos like what have been shown. I'm sure you've seen some of them i think the idf has a double role it will protect the settlers and certainly won't stop them doing these illegal um things yeah. uh, but again i think they're also there to restrict probably on orders from the 
above to restrain the settlers. They don't want a mass atrocity. Right. And so if you look at the number of deaths uh, inflicted on Palestinians in the West Bank since October the 7th, it's well over 200 now, but a very small number, I think maybe a dozen, have been people killed by settlers. Uh, and I think that that's um, a, a, a surprisingly small number, and I would have, I, I suspect there's some restraint from the army on the settlers. And who are these settlers? Where do they come from? Do they come from within Israel proper or from outside? Well, they all live in the, well, uh, they, they all live in the occupied West Bank in mm. the settlements. So two types of settlement. There are the so-called legal settlements, i.e. recognized by the state of Israel. Right. Um, uh, and then there are le illegal settlements uh, which are not recognized by the state of Israel, but they sort of are as well, you know. I mean, uh, and you, and these these are where, so around Nablus, where I've spent a lot of time, you get the so-called hilltop youth, mm. which are very um, unpleasant, not indeed, very dangerous, filled with the kind of settler, radical settler ideas, which based around um, obscure but deadly uh, sort of eschatological theses about, you know, the, the land of Israel belonging, or Eretz Israel between the river and the sea, belonging to the Jews. And the Palestinians really don't have a, a role there at all. You, uh, in your article, there was some mention of a village where 250 members of that village, the residents of that village, had to vacate because of persecution from yeah. uh, these settlers. Um, uh, there is, of course, tacit, if not overt, approval from the security forces, but also you mentioned the role of Ben Gavir, mm. uh, the national security minister. Uh, explain his particularly yeah. insidious role in this. Well, settlers have been particularly vicious since October the 7th. They've yeah. been driven by revenge. They've been driven... I think licensed in some ways, just right. to sort of rampage. Yeah. On the other hand, you've got to, if you look at the history of this problem, it goes back uh, to, uh, finally to 1967, the Six Day War, when Israel seized control, or in war of of, of the West Bank from it was up to that point it belonged to Jordan, yeah. and, and also the Golan Heights and and Gaza mm. from e Egypt. Now. The gradually after that, the, the the settler movement developed, often without the support of the state, um, uh, but always with some kind of conversation with the state. Uh, and in the last twenty years, a radical settler, very radical settler movement, has, with a sort of basically a supremacist ideology that belong, land belongs to us, yeah. uh, has has developed now. It had two the current that settler movement has two principal leaders there are others um ben Gavir, who is um head of the uh so-called well it translates as jewish power and this uh, is a right-wing party well i'd say a right wing doesn't quite you know um cover it you oh. know it's it's full of what i would say what's feel to me very strong racist ideology against Palestinians. Right, that's the way I. It looks to me. Um, I, I mean, M M Mr. Ben Gavir is is um, is one of those. Until recently, would have been a very fringe figure. Mm. Probably, he'd be arrested in Britain. I think. Mm. Um, I don't think. I, I just don't think he could operate. But anyway, there he was a fringe figure, and suddenly he became. Uh, mainstream, even though for a long time he had in his, I think it's his house or his office, one of the two, he had a picture of uh, that Baruch Goldstein, yeah. uh, the, um, again, um, sort of base, uh, at least, uh, he was, who was a settler living in Kiryat Ab, which is just above Hebron. Mm. And he's the man who went in terrible into the uh, tomb of the patriarchs in, in uh, with a machine gun and killed 29 worshippers. Um, yeah. And is now, I went up to Kiryat Arba just a, 
I was told he, he was buried there, so I went up there to have a look, and it was a shrine. Mm. It's quite interesting. Really? I mean, it's terrifying. It's chilling. Yeah. And Ben Gavir uh, had a picture of this monster. And so that tells you a lot about who he is. Yeah. Um, and, and he is nas- incredibly... Netanyahu appointed him national security minister. Yeah. Um, so he and he's been in, since October the seventh. He's been distributing guns, um, sort of uh, encouraging. I, 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 I think I'm right in saying he's encouraging the use of, of militias. Effectively, right. This is really dangerous stuff. That's fascism, actually. They encourage the you know distribute guns to your supporters. Yeah, and and Smotrich, uh, he's also part of Netanyahu's coalition. Tell me a little bit more about. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bezalel, Mot- Bezalel Smotrich, yeah. um, who who um, runs something called the Religious Zionist Party, mm. and really it's quite hard, I, th- without being an expert, to, de- to tell the difference between these two parties, which essentially maintain that uh, that not not just uh, 1948 Israel, but the West Bank. Is, is is Israeli or is Jewish, um, and Smotrich like was a marginal figure, but in order to stay in power, Mr. Netanyahu um, himself, that's probably the most right wing, far right prime minister Israel has had, yeah. got, got it went into a, a, a agreement with the with the leader with, with Ben Gavir and Smotrich of these two settler parties effectively and having made ben gavir national security minister he then made um smotridge the equivalent of the chancellor of the exchequer right um finance minister but also uh smotridge held out for the role of civil administrator running the civil administration of the west bank really now that sounds uh, it sounds rather a sort of unthreatening term, civil administration, but it, it, it's Orwellian term. Yeah. So you have to remember, uh, and I'm yet now using the language of every human rights group in the world, including the Israeli human rights organization, Bet Salem. I'm sure, uh, sure there are some human rights groups which don't, but Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, Bet Salem, others say that this is an apartheid regime. Right. And on the West Bank, it's glaring. You, you have, uh, if you're Palestinian, you, you you don't get the vote in Israel. You haven't had for uh, since 1967. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, you you are under you are subject to the control of a military regime. Regime. You're under occupation. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in in in, the, in la- the largest area of the West Bank, so-called Area C, which isn't really you think of the la- the rural parts of the West Bank. Mm. And they, they they determine whether or not you can build a house, and they'll pull it down if you don't. Uh, what what roads you can use, um, what travel you have, etc. It's um, you, you your life is chosen decided for you by the military occupation, uh, and that's the, <laughs> but the, so whether or not you can build your house or you know, the road you, you can use or whatever, uh, it's part of the civil administration. Yeah, uh, and. That's why I mean by Orwellian. It's really the it's the civilian side of the military operation. You met with, I suppose, ordinary Palestinians who live in the West Bank, who live in Section C of the West Bank. Um, what impression did you get from them about how they are living their lives on a daily basis? Well, it's really uh, I, I I spent a certain amount of time in the south. Uh, as I say, these villages which are so threatened. Yeah. And the people, every few days, the settlers would come into their village, beat them up, burn their car, bulldoze their agricultural buildings, mm-hmm. etc. Yeah. Tell them to get out, you know, and it's terrifying. I mean, it's intimidation. And they all said that if they rang up the police, Israeli police, they're told nothing to do with us. Yeah. So they they they're defenseless, um, and it was harrowing 
talking to them. You know, I arrived at one of the villages and the child shrank from me. Right. Remazed. Why? Why? Because I think he just, he was used to seeing these monstrous men. Right turning up from the neighbouring settlements and beating up his father or something. I mean, that was I mean, it's literally grotesque. The, the, in they, these are very vulnerable communities. In uh, the, where I spent more time, which was in the villages around Nablus or Ramallah in the, in the north of uh, the West Bank, mm. the, the, the villages would tend to be larger uh, and you can see that the settlers can't really, haven't got the wherewithal at this stage anyway to drive out a village of 3,000 people. Right. But they go, what they've done, been doing is going, they go in through the village of iron bars and guns and they might attack a house or two, particularly outlying houses, burn them or down, try to burn them down. Or uh, It was, and above what was most horrifying, at this one of the horrifying things was they will stop, farmers going to their land. This is the olive harvesting season, which since time immemorial is a, you know, is, is, is a lovely part, a magical part of the whole season, the whole year. And they's, they're being stopped from getting to their olives and the settlers will either burn down the olive trees or they might pick them themselves or very wickedly, they'll just wait till the end of the day when the Palestinians have picked their olives and steal them off them. It's really, it's disgusting. Right. And there's no defense a Palestinian does try to stand up for himself. He's likely to be pulled away as a terrorist and see it's all up the court. I mean, it, it is grotesque. Um, also, notice, I don't know if she's improved, the British Consul General, Diana Corner, mm. she used to issue statements condemning um, particularly grotesque settler behaviour, supposing they, or IDF behaviour, so they shot dead a child, which they often do, mm. um, but she stopped doing that when I last looked. I'm, I ought to check again, actually. Uh, why? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's horrible. I mean, it's, it's... And I think this does raise the question of British complicity and all of this. Right. Just forget about the wickedness of the Israeli state. Yeah. Um, just think about in the way in which the international community has enabled this by effectively allowing Israel and the settlers to act with total impunity towards vulnerable people. So you've used the word apartheid, another word that's been associated not only with Gaza, which we'll come to, but also the West Bank, is a slow, gradual ethnic cleansing. Would you go as far as to say that is the ultimate plan of the Netanyahu government? Okay. I, I, it's quite a difficult question. You can, if you stay st uh, 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 looking at the, uh, uh, the West Bank, mm. Um, if you look at the uh, what they're actually doing, according to Bat Salem, yeah. the Israeli human rights organization, when I last looked, 16 communities have been no longer exist, yeah. uh, which existed um, on, in, in two, it, it, on the 7th of October. Mm. About a thousand people are involved. They're small communities, these, um, but you know, it's uh, um, these are people who've just lost. Uh, that is war, those are war crimes. It's state approved, state sanctioned, yeah. state sponsored. I think fair, fair to say, um, uh, violence leading to people being driven off their land. I call that. I think that is a war crime, and there's no. It should be prosecuted, and and the, it should be called out as a war crime. And the failure of America and Britain yeah. to do this, and also to point the finger at Israel and say you're you. Netanyahu, you, Smotridge, you, yeah. um, Ben Gavir, the, the Israeli government are doing this. I, I, I find it completely baffling. But well, let's let's turn to Gaza because, of course, it's horrific what we see on our TV screens and on our social media feeds on a daily basis. I mean, it's uh, it's a it's an appalling. Uh, it's been an appalling two months nearly of of violence and and a large number of. Gazans have, have died and you've intimated there that there isn't a total silence or you know or, or a very casual relationship between the United States Britain the European Union and Israel what what's going on there why are the political elites the so-called liberal elites of the world why are they so silent at, at what is so obviously um you know a an appalling abuse of human rights yeah it's um 
I hate, I don't know whether to use the word genocide. I'm not an expert mm. on the term, but you're seeing mass transfer of civilians. Yeah. You're seeing um, the slaughter of innocent civilians on a huge scale. Yeah. The destruction of civilian infrastructure, the destruction of hospitals, the, the schools, the targeting of groups like journalists. It's pretty obvious that they're doing that. Yeah. Um, and he's stick, sticking, first of all, with Britain. The fact that the British uh, Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, yeah. uh, is happy to say that he's giving Israel his unequivocal support. Yeah. And then they say that they support, um, and then they say, you know, that Israel is abiding by international law. They even yeah. kind of cut, some ministers have said this. It's not true. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and even more surprising, given that he comes from a progressive political party with a record of standing up for minorities and human rights, yeah. I find um, uh, Keir Starmer's. Uh, uh, Keir Starmer's conduct extraordinary, particularly since I th uh, he's explicitly said very early on that it's that collective punishment in the form of sort of withholding water and food was uh, uh, Israel it was entitled to do that, um, and so we have a uh, the, the both the main political parties in this country supporting, um, I mean really strongly supporting. Uh, the activities of the Israeli state, the Israeli army in Gaza. Um, it, it takes a lot of st to stomach this. I mean, it's this in, in a country which claims to want, care about human rights and democracy and so forth. Yeah. Um, I, I want to turn to the position of Keir Starmer because I think it's particularly egregious, uh, in particular because so many Muslims, I think I remember reading that in 2019, the intention of most Muslim voters, 71% of Muslim voters voted for the Labour Party. So it's always been the home of uh, Muslim votes. But also, we know that Keir Starmer comes from a very strong human rights background. Mm -hmm. And so he knows about international law and he's aware of uh, the the various statutes and conventions that guide international law. Why has Keir Starmer so stubbornly stuck to this position that sounds like it's advocating, if not greenlighting, the Israeli state? Yeah, you actually have to um, ask him. Uh, you, but unfortunately, he ha he has a record of being dishonest and giving misleading right. answers yeah. to um, to questions. Yeah. I keep a record of political lies. Yes, you wrote a book on it. <laughs> yes. Starting with Tony Blair, I think. Yeah, Tony yes. Blair. Um, um, so, what, can we, so let's just say we have to speculate. Okay. Rather than I can't, without looking inside Mr. Starmer's or Sir Keir's brain. And so yes. I, um, I think part of it is the, great, the Corbyn business, you know, the, the anti-Semitism charges laid against Jeremy Corbyn, right. which uh, Mr. Corbyn f greatly denies, and I think his rebuttals are convincing. Right. I don't think he's an anti Semite. Yeah. Um, but that this this dominated the kind of, it was a huge press uh, witch hunt. And Starmer decided, after becoming leader, to define himself as leader, as the man who has stamped out. Labour anti-Semitism. Now, given that he was beside, he was a supporter and, in his own words, a friend of Corbyn, mm. uh, while Corbyn was leader, this is a very retrospective thing to do. Right. And given, I'm sure you've read the Martin Ford report, which uh, gives is a major corrective to the press hysteria. Um, and uh, if anybody hasn't read it, they should. And it's quite damning, I think, by implication at any rate, of Mr. Starm Sir Keir Starmer's uh, conduct, because, um, but that, that because it seems deeply unfair and wrong. But the fact is that he, having chosen to define himself by not being Corbyn, mm -hmm. I think he, f and then this all happened. I think that he felt that he 
uh, had to his 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 reaction to the bombing was may have been shaped. I'm saying this is only speculation. Yes, may have been shaped by the the the, the his urgent desire to distance himself from Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. Um, there is all, and the second factor, which may be equally important or more important, is Sir Keir Starmer is. Um, I think he values his relationship with the United States. Right. All British political, anybody wanting to be British Prime Minister tends to do that. Yeah. Uh, and certainly his um, unlamented predecessor, Tony Blair, did. I mean, but this is, so some, for some reason, we, we do have a special relationship. It's not a relationship of equals. Yeah. I mean, you know perfectly well. It, Biden had called for a ceasefire five weeks ago. Starmer and Sunak would have jumped to attention and done the same. Yes, at once. Yeah, they take the they take their lead from the United States. I think it's wrong. I think because Biden is clear has been has been a mess. It does enormous discredit to the to the Western world. This yeah. blind support for Israel. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't condemn the atrocities committed by Hamas mm -hmm. on the 7th of October. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't want war crimes investigations into what Hamas did, but you should also yeah. demand war crimes investigations into the, you know, the what's happened since with the Israelis. Um, and they've killed, what is it, probably six, we know 16,000, probably substantially more, probably yeah. more than 20,000 people, including I mean, it's it's unbearable what they've done, and for, for have to have done it with the full-blooded assent or of the leadership of your of most of Europe, Britain, and the United States has brought the West into great disrepute. Peter, you care a lot about the rule of law and about justice, and I know from previous discussions with you that you believe there are very strong institutions in these countries that uphold these very valued, let's call them liberal democratic values. But then there is a question about how the worthiness or the efficacy of these values or how they're presented now to the rest of the world. Um, I interviewed the former head of Al Jazeera, Wada Khanfer, yeah. uh, a couple very of weeks man, back. Yeah. Uh, excellent. And he uh, argued that uh, Gaza... Uh, symbolize something greater. It, it's almost like a, a graveyard for liberal values. Like Western values are now no longer going to be supported or seen by those in the East or those in the South uh, as as values that are that are that are worth upholding for them. I mean, do you think that this is going to the, the whole Gaza episode is as irreversibly you can say uh, damaged? the West and its value system. I've been following um, Western foreign policy now for a long time. Mm. And so none of this is a surprise. Right. I mean, you know, if you think, go back to the Iraq invasion in 2003, that was an illegal invasion. Yeah. Um, based on fabricated information. Yeah. And um, so, I, 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 and I, it's very easy, it's very convincing to make an argument that the United States and Britain have, have been rogue states, to mm. use terminology used against people like Gaddafi and mm. Saddam Hussein, etc. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, I, it was very moving being in um, East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. People would say to you, you know, I. You know, I used to look to the West. I thought that they were on our side. They would bring us some justice. And now that's yeah. just gone. Right. Uh, and that's what Palestinians who really did believe and like, love, in, I think, the, the West in many ways, now feel that this, is, uh, this isn't, the, can't be the case anymore. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, the, one thing is obvious. If you're looking towards a conclusion of all of this, mm. Uh, America is wholly unfit to have any role in right. the future. Of, I'm not saying it won't have a role. It's just unfit to have a role. It's completely yeah. biased. 
um, you know, it's, it's been held up as a, a mediator for peace for ages, you know, and it's played it, you know, Camp David and so on. And it's not, it is not, a, it is not a fair player. It's on the other, it's always of the Israelis. Mm. Cannot be trusted by any Palestinian. Well, what's your perspective on the position of Ursula von der Leyen from the Ursula von der Leyen from yeah. the European uh, Union Commission, the President of the Commission, who again was very, I mean, her position was, you know, probably even more firm than the Biden position. And uh, she, you know, came across as very pro Israel. Now, the European Union has historically at least been a, a great funder of of uh, of people of Gaza and has taken a slightly more nuanced position uh, towards Palestine. Um, why do you think such uh, illustrious liberal institutions like the European Union have so succumbed to uh, the Israeli narrative? I, I don't understand it, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, you've got to look at the way... I think Germany, for very obvious reasons, eh? the Holocaust is overcome with national guilt right um and I, I, I and that's easy to understand they ban demonstrations in germany for pro palestinian demonstrations it seems they shouldn't do though i yeah. mean it's uh, but you, they are overcome it is some in the case of britain something has changed i mean i uh, um there used to be quite a fair minded or even handed discourse mm. about it, about israel yeah. Palestine, um, in the Conservative Party, are partly shaped by, there may have been an element of anti-Semitism. No question there was anti-Semitism in the Conservative Party, and probably still is actually, but there was. Yeah. But there was also the experience of, um, you know, the, the, the Jew, Jewish terrorism, as it was seen by the British at the time before independence, for, in 1948 was aimed, you know, against British targets. Yeah. Um, King David, you know, the explosion of the King David Hotel, a pro -pro campaign of assassination, attacks on, horrible attacks on British soldiers in the mandate, mm. Palace, Palestine and so on, yeah. aimed, aimed at driving the British out. But also I think there was just a general fair-mindedness. Mm. So you, it, I think I've, Right, saying in 1973 war, for instance, the British wouldn't had, had an embargo on arms to either side. Mm. Um, Thatcher, who's was pro, very, pro, very, very philo-Semitic and very uh, pro-Israel, but was always happy to condemn or ready to condemn um, Israeli atrocities, mm. Shatila and, and Sabra camp, the you know, the Israeli abetted massacre. Yeah of uh, Palestinian refugees, uh, you know, she called it pure barbarism. Mm. And, and I don't understand why the new generation, or rather the new generation of Tories can't do that. They mm. seem unable to find that language, yeah. which Thatcher had. And I do point this out to them. And I think there are two reasons. One actually is the amazing ignorance of how the world works or yes. recent history of the Middle East. Um, and I think one has been the terrific success of the Israeli lobby mm. in Parliament, in particular the Conservative Friends of Israel. Very perfectly honourable objective, by the way, to put the Israeli point of view. But they have had it. I think they've been a bit too successful in a way for their own good. Because if um, I think a real friend of Israel would criticize Israel if I was them. I mean, they, I asked them, have you ever criticized Israel for anything? Hmm. No. Hmm. You know, not Sabra and Satilla, not, uh, you know, the horrific attack on Lebanon in 2006, not the, no, they haven't, uh, you know, not the basic, the new basic law, not sort of creeping, no, no settlement, no, they, they won't, criticize, they've not criticized anything. Yes. And I think this is, They've been so they've been, they've convincingly made the case to the many conservative MPs, the great majority it seems, that Israel is you know plucky little Israel, surrounded by enemies, 
the one shining beacon of democracy and human rights in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, they're entitled to make that case, but it's, it has lent, I think that it has meant that Israel, Israeli leaders have a sense of impunity. They've been given it, never forget, and a very good example of this, terrible example actually, is yeah. was Boris Johnson when he was prime minister, at the end, in two, two years ago, wrote a letter to the, to the Conservative Friends of Israel, mm. saying, look, uh, we won't get, Britain would not support any war crimes investigations mm. into Israel's conduct. Well, it's, you're saying just uh, carry on killing that, really, aren't you? Mm. And, uh, and so I, I think that they, a candid friend of Israel, which Britain, say, Maggie Thatcher was prepared to be, would say, if, you're, if, if you step beyond a certain line, you say, look, you call them out. No, no, and that's going to be investigated and the perpetrators will find themselves at The Hague and so on. That would be, um, that would be the proper way of dealing with this and it would have, might have helped uh, Israel evolve in a different way. Can I return back to the Labour Party and in particular the position of many of the Muslims who are representatives in the Labour Party? I mean, something that a lot of the Muslim community have been quite disturbed by is just how many of those Muslim representatives have been ready to toe the line. I mean, Shabana Mahmood comes to mind. She's the MP for Birmingham Ladywood, policy director of the uh, Starmer campaign in twenty four. Uh, again, you know, very silent over Gaza, even though historically she has had a pretty good record on Palestine. Um, there is this growing feeling that the Labour Party structurally is really not going to stand up for causes that Muslims uh, feel strongly about, in particular international causes. Um, what accounts for... Uh, the inability of these representatives. I mean, Ladywood is, is, is ranked in the top five of Muslim concentrated constituencies in the country. What accounts for their complicity, I suppose, is the word uh, when it comes to such horrendous crimes? I agree with the term complicity yeah. because by not speaking out, you're helping to enable them. Yeah. You're making it easier for Israel uh, to commit them. Yeah without being held to account. Yeah. And as the, uh, you know, everyone thinks Starmer's going to be the next prime minister, and so the next British prime minister, whereas Sunak is seen as increasingly as some form of yes. great mistake. <laughs> and uh, the, you know, so, so Starmer's got a lot of power, even though he's not in power. Yeah. And so worry to have reacted in a different way, um, as Jeremy Corbyn would have done, not Tony Blair. I think Tony Blair would never yeah. uh, criticise, if I'm right, criticise Israel. No. Um, but uh, uh, but um, earlier Labour leaders, for sure. No. I, I think, again, I talked a little bit earlier on about the legacy of the Corbyn years yeah. and the charges laid against Corbyn uh, and the way that Starmer has, has sought to shape himself, right. to define himself against Starmer. And he has got a, an authoritarian leadership style. He's talked to build himself up as a sort of man who can't be challenged. Mm. So it's partly that. But it's morally, many people think this is morally disgusting. Yeah. And... I think you can draw co comparisons with Labour in 2005, can't you, when yeah. Tony Blair going to war against Iraq um, offended many Muslims in Britain. Yeah. Uh, and was, they've almost been a Labour bloc, haven't they? The Absolutely. Muslim, the I think the largest bloc probably Labour yeah. had from any ethnic community. Yeah. Um, but that leads me to what I sense on the ground, and I could be wrong, I've got a partial sense, but the feeling I get from the Muslim community, and that was backed up by a census, uh, a, a survey recently by the Muslim Census Group, which indicated that if an election took place tomorrow, only 5% of the Muslim community would vote, would vote Labour. And that was from a 30,000 sample of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, in their survey. Um, I yesterday was at a meeting in Ilford North, West Streeting's constituency. Mm -hmm. He's got a 5,000 majority. 
And there is a strong groundswell of opinion there that we need to stand against West Treating, uh, who's, of course, the shadow health secretary and, and is sort of a leading light within the Labour Party. Um, the impression I get is they want to put forward an independent to, to fight him using the Muslim and the, the wider community vote. Um, I suppose I've got two questions there. Firstly, is that a wise thing for the Muslim community to do in the sense that would it lead to greater, I don't know, marginalization of the Muslim community? And do you see that strategy of putting forward independence ultimately successful in a, in a system like ours? To answer your first question, yeah. I think the Labour Party has uh, made the decision, Starmer's Labour Party, to marginalise uh, uh, British Muslims. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence of very bad uh, Islamophobia inside, inside Starmer's Labour Party. The um, Labour Files programmes. Um, produced Al Jazeera. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 some of it was quite shocking about the way that um, Labour was behaving towards its Muslim voters and Muslim officers as well. Yeah. Well, I really recommend people should see that. Yeah. A and on that, and following, you know, the re reaction to Labour's morally negligent reaction to Israeli conduct in Gaza and the West Bank. I think that um, Muslims are in entitled to ask, you know, we feel that they've, by the way, this is not simply a Muslim issue. Yeah. <laughs> it's, no. it's actually yeah. a basic human issue of, yeah. of human rights and decent conduct. Uh, but I, I uh, in in the light of Labour's tolerance of Islamophobia, which uh, we need to discuss more at a certain stage, mm. um, on an epic scale, plus its uh, foreign its foreign policy issues, I think that you, you Muslims are. Uh, they can't vote Tory because Tories are worse, I'd say. I mean, the Islamophobia inside the Conservative Party is rampant. Yes. It's a racist party, the Conservatives now. Sayyid Obarsi has effectively said so, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, and uh, of course the police. So you, you can't, uh, and why not? I think that, I think in many ways, Muslims would find themselves um, aligned with most, many, many ordinary non-Muslim Voters. I mean, if you look at the figures about the war, I think it's something like three quarters of voters would like a ceasefire, mm. and neither of the two main parties are able to support that position. I think what you have here is is not so much a, a uh, um, marginalisation of of just of Muslim voters. You have a an abyss dividing the political media class. I mean, the media, yeah. mass media, is part of the problem too, yeah. from ordinary voters in this country. Uh, and so I don't simply see that, you know, that, which is a something gone wrong with our politics and also the morality at the top of our politics. Can I finish with um, uh, a question about the Conservative Party? Now, I remember back to our interview last year, you see yourself as a traditional Conservative. And in, in so many ways, uh, traditional conservatives like yourself or Ken Clark have been sort of forced out of, of the party. I know you're not a card-carrying member, but, but forced out of, of that broad church that was the conservative party that brought together traditional one nation as well as uh, more right-leaning conservatives. Um, it seems to me that after the next general election, the party will lurch even further to the right, maybe with a Kemi Bedenok or even a Suala Braverman mm. leadership. Um, do you feel that uh, conservatives like you no longer have a home in the Conservative Party for the near future or even further future? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this quite hard. Yeah. And actually, the events of the last week have... Uh, really clarified this yeah. this issue. So you are now having a a battle for the the leadership of the, or the heart of the 
Conservative Party going on in office, but really with an eye, I think, to when after the next election yeah. has been lost. Uh, and on the one hand, we have um, bad, uh, sorry, Suella Braverman. Mm. Migration is, is, is the great issue, yeah. which has been identified by the far right. Right. And Suella Braverman is clearly putting herself forward as the leader of this. Uh, she got a very important new ally in in, in uh, Jenrick, Robert Jenrick, the who resigned, yeah, yeah, the immigration minister who resigned. So you've uh, you're going to have I de- I, there's talk of an of a, of a, 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 a bid to unseat uh, Rishi Sunak. I don't think that will happen. No. Uh, on the, but after that, after uh, after an election defeat, that is going to be a huge battle. Yeah, and if the Bad, if the Braverman tendency wins, I think the Conservative Party will actually cease to be... Well, it'll, it will be able to keep the name Conservative, which is very important because it legitimises, but its nature will be like the National Front, really? Front National in France. As bad or, as that. Yeah, yeah, really? or AFD in Germany, or um, it'll be a far-right uh, party. Um, very frightening. It will be proto-fascist, yeah. Without not every element of fascism, it's, you know, the fascism encouraged the street violence. But Rotherman came quite close to doing that, uh, was playing with that anyway, yeah. uh, with her disgraceful remarks about the uh, the marches a few yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. Well, actually, one one very final question. Um, Last year, I asked you a very similar question about Muslims here, especially young Muslims who've decided that maybe Britain is just not their long-term home. And there is a movement of, of Brits, of British Muslims moving, to, moving abroad, sometimes to other Muslim countries like Turkey, maybe even Eastern countries beyond, beyond Turkey. Uh, that may not be Muslim countries, but just moving away because of the hostile environment they find themselves in. I again, and I've noticed in the f- last two months over Gaza, that feeling has intensified mm-hmm. because not only is the environment hostile, but also the political class is obviously not responding to what they see to be a, just a, a, an obvious sentiment that everyone should believe in. Uh, we're against genocide and against uh, you know such such mass slaughter. Um, I suppose what I want is is your comment on that. I mean, how I see that is very likely. I think over the next decade, you will see a migration away from the West of young Muslims. I mean, uh, I, 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 sorry to this is turning out to be a very long question, but uh, I spoke to a group of uh, young university students recently. You know, these are people at LSE in Kings, and almost every single one of them said that after they graduate, they're trying to find a route to leave the country. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very unexplored phenomenon. Um, but, it, but, but yeah, I would like your comments on that, um, Peter. Yeah, well, first of all, it's very distressing. Mm. I mean, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that. Yeah. I mean, not, I think we, in, a, in the way you've described it. Uh, secondly, of course, it, Douglas Murray and that tendency would love to hear this. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's an objective to depopulate uh, Britain of, it, of, of many of its Muslims. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you just read the rhetoric of um, people like Murray. Yeah. Um, it makes sense because, I, I, I mean, my, I met Miss Saeed Avasi in her excellent book has a called it the enemy within yeah and that has got worse that deliberate framing of the britain's muslim majority as sorry britain's muslim minority as as terroristic or or, or a potential enemy has 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 got worse and you just look for evidence actually i'm working on this i'm look, trying to find more examples but there's people just by expressing children in schools who just express support for Palestine find yeah. themselves pulled in by the 
what, what, you know, the thought police, I mean, the prevent yeah. officers. Yeah. Now, this is uh, horrible. I mean, the, the idea that expressing, opposing the, uh, the, the same British government which supports the slaughter in Gaza um, is at the same time targeting people who oppose, who, who are calling for a ceasefire is, uh, and the, the British media sh shares a lot of that. It supports the, it supports Israel and Gaza, but it portrays people who went on the marches as, as hate marches. They, they've they got their priorities all wrong. It isn't, it's worth saying, it's not just a problem for Muslims. It's a problem for a lot of the, uh, the most ordinary, decent British people. There is a twisted value structure being imposed on us by this uh, far right, and I would even, I, we have a far right conservative government at the moment, let right. alone what shape or form the conservatives may take after an election defeat. It, it's quite a. We have a fight for liberal democracy on our hands at the moment, and I would, um, I, I'd ask your friend, <laughs> friends you were talking to, to reconsider, <laughs> simply because I want. To join them in their fight for British values, because that's what they want. That's yeah. what they're fighting for: is British values against a government which is increasingly anti-British in the sense that Britain has always stood up for embraced minorities, whether they're ethnic groups or religious groups. I mean, we've had this long, wonderful battle to include people in our society, and to suddenly start excluding them. Hmm? Yeah. Peter Oban, it's been wonderful, as always, speaking to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you. A very serious conversation. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website, thinkinmuslim.com, to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.